and welcome back to another episode of the Bash Mania podcast. If you're new around here, this is a wrestling podcast where you can get to know the absolute best wrestlers in the sport and hear their stories. Today, we have another reigning world team member on the show, and a busy one at that, as my guest Jenna actually wrestles off this weekend when she takes on the winner of Olympic and world champ Helen Maroulis versus two-time world silver medalist Ali Reagan in a best-of-three series for a spot on the Pan Am team where they'll have a chance to qualify the weight for the Olympics. And not only does Jenna have to prepare and stay focused for wrestle-offs and the Olympic trials and this entire road to Tokyo, but Jenna is also an active soldier. So, yeah, they don't really get much tougher than her. Needless to say, today's conversation should be great. And if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, be sure to subscribe today on Apple or Spotify, wherever you listen. And if you do listen on Apple Podcasts, be sure to leave a five-star rating and review. There is now also merch available, hats, t-shirts, stickers, magnets, you name it, all available at shop.bashmania.com if you want to pledge your loyalty to the show. And now, the reason you tuned in. It's Bashomania! Let me tell you something, brother. He gave us everything he had in him tonight. What you gonna do when Bashomania runs wild? Oh, it's gonna be a good one. And business just picked up here on the podcast. Oh, yeah. All right, we are here with Jenna. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing good. So what I was just going to tell you, I'm like, all right, let's just get this started. So I had Victoria Anthony on just a couple days ago. The episode just launched. And I I usually write out my intros because I want to make sure to articulate them clearly or to speak them clearly. And I always watch the debate of men's freestyle, women's freestyle, and Greco and, and the relevance and importance. And I wanted to like start the episode out when Victoria was on by saying, look at let me just make the the progress for, for like the fan who doesn't care or is ignorant to it. I wrestled the middle school, high school was never any good. I, but I, I, but I wrestled folk style. Naturally, I think if you pay attention to folk style, you then get into college, which is folk style. And then if you're watching that, you tend to watch them after that. So you're watching them in the senior level. So it's like, okay, a natural progression for me was men's folk style, men's freestyle. And then one area that I think it's hard Number one, that's that was a big one to start getting fans when they participated in it to get them to cross over is harder. And then if they're not winning a lot, it's even harder, which is where I think Greco fails. And now it's like now that I'm more ingrained in the sport and the amount of dominance the women's side of the sport has had, it's it's hard not to tune in. Like I was just tweeting about it because I don't know why there's not more coverage, but like the wrestle offs happening this weekend are nuts. Yeah. Like it, it's insane to to look at the names. Like Helen and Allie are gonna wrestle for a shot to wrestle you. And I'll get into that. Like we're gonna kind of talk about that. But you know, kind of going back to the point of one of the things that I've been having fun with is getting to know people. That the more I become a fan of the sport, and the more you see people, and it's hard to get to know somebody without like just going on their Instagram and following them. Because if I start following you on Instagram. I start following you from today, right? It's hard to get those backstories. Even yeah, for and it's some, all perception, you know? <laughs> yeah, for sure. And even like some of some of the most popular men in the sport who have all the media spotlight on them, you still, it, it's hard to really dive in. Um, so I'm pumped to have this conversation. It was a very long way of saying, uh, I'm excited <laughs> to have this conversation because I want to get to know you more. And, I, and I'm excited to, to be able to do that on the podcast where not only myself, but all the listeners can... Uh, get to know you too. So big year, but before we talk about 2020, let's go back to the beginning. Tell me about how you got started in wrestling. Okay. So I started when I was six years old. I'm originally from Long Island, New York. So um, I kind of just picked up the sport out of the blue. Like my, my dad never wrestled. My brother is actually autistic. So I think naturally, like I grew up and we didn't really do like board games or things like that. So, you know, my brother and I just play wrestle. Yeah. And so when I was in the first grade and a flyer was being passed out, it was so natural for me to be interested. I was like, that seems really cool. I do that with all my friends already. <laughs> right. So I grabbed the flyer and was like stoked about it. 
And this kid in my class like rips that out of my hands and was like, Jenna, you, you can't do that. You're a girl. And I like ripped the flyer <laughs> back. And I know I, I've told this story like so many times, but it's so real and present to me. And like, I remember it vividly. I can picture my classroom. I remember being told that I couldn't do something just because I was a girl. Yeah. And I was like stunned that even at that young of an age, there was already limitations on what I could do. Yep. And that's not to, you know, jump in on the whole women's fight, but like at a young age, you know, being told like, sure. you can't do this. Here. And, you know, I was determined to do it at that point, just out of spite, really. Sure. And, <laughs> you know, I was like a true New Yorker with that attitude. Yep. Yep. And like that East Coast, it's, it's in me. And I begged my parents and my mom was looking at me like I was insane because I was, you know, I did the progression. Like I was in dance. I was in acting classes. I did all the time. And my mom was like, Jenna, you can't do that. You'll be the only girl. And I was like, so what's your point? And she kind of looks back at me and laughs and was like, you know what? I guess I don't have a point. And, and literally, I put my wrestling shoes on, started at six and never stopped because it was just it was so much fun. It was natural for me. And when did you realize you were good? You know, I was listening to one of your podcasts with like Kyle Dake, actually. And I like you had asked that question. And I yeah. was like thinking to myself, like, yeah, I wonder when I thought I was good. And I think I, I was really lucky. I had parents and my mom, especially that. I mean, my biggest hype, hype woman that there is. So <laughs> no matter what I did in life, my parents told me I was the best at it. And I was going to be the best. If I wasn't today, I would be. Yep. So. Wow. You know, when I was in acting and all those and I kept like getting these auditions and doing that, I was like, I just had this little kid confidence. Like there was nothing that you could take from me. I just had it, you know, from the start. And I remember watching the Olympics on TV. It was the Winter Olympics. Like women's wrestling wasn't even in it. It's a summer yep. sport. Yeah. Women's weren't even in it until 2004. But right. I remember watching it on TV and being like, I'm going to the Olympics. Like, <laughs> I don't know what sport, but I mean, I'm going to go there. And so I think with that confidence and then I... um you know, I started wrestling boys and I, like I dominated wrestling the boys at a young age. And actually my first loss in my career came to a female. And it was so funny to me because I was dominating boys, you know, like at six years old, like throwing headlocks, like whatever. I was winning matches, you know? And then I went, entered a girl wrestling tournament with like, it was called USGWA at the time. And that's all we had. And I was thinking I was going to win it. Like no problem. And I get like tech ball. Like I get my, my butt kicked. And I was like shocked that I was like, I lost to a girl. Like it was like, yeah. it was so yeah. far fetched to me. Um, and then I realized like girls wrestling is no joke because all these girls around the state are all wrestling boys. So we're all like built tough. Um, so I would say around that, like, you know, like 10, 11 age, I was like, you know, I really have something for it. And then I mean, I, I always say that like when I was younger, I didn't realize how good I was. You know, like when I was in high school, I remember I went overseas to the clip on tournament and I beat like the reigning world silver medalist at 16. And I had no idea who she was. I was like, I mean, I don't know. Like I remember Gary Abbott interviewing me like it was a big deal. And I was like, I have no idea who I just wrestled. And then like, you know, I go, I win Fargo. I win wrestler of the year. I win high school wrestler of the year again. And all this time, because I wasn't like, meddling at the senior level yet it just I was in my head I was like there was still more to reach so I'm kind of glad I had that attitude at, at a younger age and and what was the process like going from realizing really good and it's one of the reasons I asked the question like I'm always interested when people start to have that self-awareness I think this sport requires so much self-awareness and I'm curious too, like what was the process like for going to college, right? Like the women's side of the sport is so different. It seems than obviously the men's where it's like, I don't want to say it's more black and white, but it's been so defined for so long. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, girls wrestling barely had any colleges that were even had it. So like when I was younger, the, the options was like Oklahoma city, it was Cumberland's and it was Northern Michigan, the Olympic training center. So when I was younger, you know, that's just like, that's where all the Olympians in the Missouri Valley, like, that's just where you went because there was like five or six options. Right. And then when I was in high school, like I actually have a totally different probably story than some of the other ones because like I didn't go wrestle for a college because at 15, I, well, at 14, I was on the cadet team. I go to that. The coach on that trip is the head or the assistant coach at Northern Michigan for the Olympic, training, Olympic education center at the time. Yep. And he offers me an opportunity to train with them 
but he was like, in a few years, like you're 14, like maybe your senior year. <laughs> so like, you know, I win the cadet Pan Ams, don't think anything of it. And then the summer passes and uh, they, they call my parents and they basically said that a college student dropped out and we already have four high school students, but we're willing to add the fifth one so it could be Jenna. Wow. wow. And so immediately I was like, yes, I'm going. Like, I don't care. Like, I'm, I'm going. And then my mom was like, you know, I got to convince your dad, you know, it was like, that's baby girl. Like, you know, she can't just <laughs> right. go move to Northern Michigan. And after they had said yes, I remember it's like sitting there and actually realizing like what it all meant. Like it meant I was leaving New York, leaving my high school, would be without my parents, like everything was going to be new for me. But it all worked out. <laughs> yeah, it has. And I'm curious too, because... You know, one of the things I, I just brought up with Victoria in the last episode was, you know, I'm always curious what it's like to transition from youth wrestling to high school to college to the senior level. And for you, same as her, as I imagine, it, it's not only been such a different transition and, and different experience, but you then have women's wrestling evolving and growing so rapidly. So it's not just like, okay, now I'm going to college, I got college classes, or now I'm doing this, or the coaching's different. Like, I've kind of heard that routine, and I'm starting to understand that more and more. But for you guys, it's there's that level of the sport is also evolving. So it's not, it's not like it's just, okay, this is different college. I'm moving away from my friends and family. I'm moving. Like, what has that been like to continue to evolve personally as you go from jump levels in your wrestling career, but then also side by side for women's wrestling to evolve? And I think like not even just limiting it as just women's wrestling, like it that has evolved tremendously. Like it's insane, but wrestling in a whole like when i rewatch old film and i see like you know the wrestling has changed almost every single year yeah. you know where we used to be like three periods if you win the first two there isn't a third period right but you could literally like you i remember watching my old film and it's like oh i'm going to the ball to the bag to pick a ball to like see what who gets the the leg like and, and i'm proud as like a federation where we sure. come like you tune on wrestling and it's it's pretty easy to understand. You know what I mean? Like there's the, there's the Yanni Zane scrambles that are insane. Of, of course. course. <laughs> like without a doubt, but for the random person that picks it up, like even people that I've met in my life, like people in the military and they start watching and they're like, you know, they can pick it up. So it's insane to see a few years ago, you'd be watching the match. And even I would be like, I have no idea who's winning. Like I'm, yep. I'm on, just, I'm on you know? or it's like, Oh, now they're going to the bag to grab a ball. Um, so I'm really proud in that sense. I'm proud that women's wrestling is, it's just everywhere. It's booming and it's so, it's so respected. And, you know, that's the whole goal. I remember when I was younger, getting asked about being like a great female wrestler. And it was like, I don't want to be known as a great female wrestler. Like I want right. to be at just, just wrestlers. So yep. I think we're really on that trend of getting there. And, and I'm curious too, like, this is kind of going to go in two totally different directions, but it makes me think of both points. One is you brought up serving in the military, which thank you because I have so much freedom that I take for granted, I think. Um, and I think that's the most, I don't think there's a bigger sacrifice in serving in the military. I really don't. So I'm curious what led you to start serving the military and, and total opposite question. But just before I forget, like I'm also curious, like, I can tell you're very knowledgeable on the sport, like all around. You seem very like up to date with everything and, and very intuitive. You, you can tell if you follow you on social, like you, you know, you're wrestling. So I'm curious, you know, I feel like there's, there's different levels people have where they are into the sport and they're good at the sport, but they also don't follow it. Like Yanni, Yanni's a super fan. Like he's not normal. The fact that he can almost know Russian names better than you ask, like, and, and yeah. you can tell that you're that kind of fan too. So I'm curious what, when, when that started. So both what led you to serving the military and then also the, the fandom of wrestling, how that grew. So I'll, I'll answer the fandom one first, because um, I think, you know, like, years ago, like when I started wrestling, right there, you couldn't just get on YouTube and watch female wrestlers. You right. couldn't even watch like pro wrestlers. Like there wasn't flow wrestling and there wasn't all these great, like, you know, people, you know, even just people's own social media. And I mean, that's a huge, in a, 
in itself. Like yep. 2012 was the Olympic Games where people had social media and it made everybody more interested. Um, and so I, I was a super fan from the beginning because I had to. Like my mom, I didn't come from a wrestling background. You know, I came from, a, you know, a, a place in, in New York and, you know, I wrestled in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and they just didn't really want female wrestlers unless you were right. legit. And so everywhere I went, I had to earn my keep pretty much. And yeah. that led my mom to be obsessively like ordering textbooks of wrestling, like whatever <laughs> they had out at the time, yeah. my mom was ordering them and then doing like the putting the paper bag over it so that the other wrestling dads wouldn't see my mom, you know, reading wrestling techniques. <laughs> You know, and I'd be like on the carpet in the living room and she'd be like, hit a Granby roll. And I was like, please stop. Like, this is not how, <laughs> this is not what I want to do. So like, you just had to be a super fan. And, you know, women's wrestling was only in in 04. So I insanely knew every single person, where they went to college, like what, what they did, you know, what their majors were, because they were in the position where I wanted to be. And so I think that's what makes little kids in general. Like anytime you see somebody sure. in a position where you're like, shoot, what shoes are they wearing? What are they doing? Like, I need to know so I can yeah. be just like, them. so I definitely, my dogs are acting crazy. Um, so I definitely just had to be a super fan just so I could get the knowledge of myself. Yeah. And, you know, I just, I love what I do. So it's important. Yeah, that makes sense. That seems to be how it goes. So tell me now, too, about joining the military in that path. So I was a, originally a resident athlete at the training center. I was a resident athlete at Northern Michigan. So I did two training centers. And it just like this when I moved to Colorado, it just wasn't a perfect fit for me. Like I just wanted more coaches that were not a national team coach. Like I wanted people in my corner. Sure type of deal and it's nothing against them I just wanted something different and I heard about the military and I knew Iris Smith you know world champion Jermiel Byers world champion and you start realizing like a lot of these good people are in the army wrestling and I just kind of asked questions and at first I didn't really see myself like doing it because it's like such a such a commitment you know you're joining the army yeah and then it was just like one summer I was like I didn't place how I wanted to at the trials. I was like going through a lot of stuff personally and on a whim was like, I'm joining the army. Like that's what I want to do. And I went to basic right after I didn't make the Olympic team in 16. And it was, it was the best decision. You know, I spent all summer while some people were, you know, training and doing their wrestling stuff and basically watching someone else go to the Olympics. You know, I was thrown into boot camp and, yeah. <laughs> you know, wearing my yeah. sack all summer <laughs> And only like writing my friends and my family, you know, like barely hearing from them. And I always say like, you know, I joined for wrestling, but what I got out of it all was that I love being a soldier. You know, I really uh, take pride in what I do and, you know, like it is an honor and it gives me this, gives me something else to myself besides wrestling, you know, like I'm a soldier first, wrestler second. Yep. So, yeah. And it's funny too, cause my brother joined the Marines on a whim. He, he, Ran a roofing company, and then hey, just one day he came and he, I, I believe he had moved out at the time. At, I was still in high school, and he like basically came to the house to get his birth certificate. And me just being oh, like a yeah. nosy kid, I'm like, what are you doing that for? I was like, I'm joining the Marines. Wait, what? <laughs> like, you want to talk? Yeah, like so whole does, life. Right. So how does that work now? Like, can you get deployed and stuff? Like, how does that interfere, or how does that work with your training? So WCAP in itself is a non-deployable unit, but you have to – earn your keep, you know, if I'm not the way I'm supposed to back to a regular unit doing your kind of thing. So there's that kind of pressure, but at the end of the day, like your, my goal is to not be number three. It's not to be number two, it's to be number one. So sure. I don't really like focus on those day-to-day -day pressures. And I just, I continue my, my job. Like I do my wrestling job and I do my military job. I'm up to date on all my stuff online and in person, like my MOS is like a computer job. So it's pretty easy to like stay up to date, you know, yeah. like uh, I'm not an infantry soldier, so I'm not, you know, pew pew and out there. <laughs> right. So a lot of people like misunderestimate that. And, you know, I just in November went to basic leadership course and that's how I got promoted to sergeant. And that's why I missed the world cup. But yeah, so it's, you know, it's, it's all a balance. Like not everything's easy. There's some days like all last week I thought I was going to have a little bit more time in between and I had more military obligations than I thought I would. And 
you know, it was a busy week, but that's life. You know, nothing's nothing's easy. <laughs> and I'm curious because I think to be a soldier, it, it takes incredible discipline and sacrifice. And to be a wrestler, it, incredible discipline and sacrifice. And, you know, you say it so easily that you don't focus on the pressure. But I'm sure there's people listening that are like, wait, how do you not focus on the pressure? Right. Because, like, there's endless yeah. things out there that, you know, they stress, don't sweat the little things. Don't focus on this. Control what you can control. And all these other oh, yeah. things that I think are, are such great theories. But I know, especially like younger people, it, it's harder because as, as you get exposed to more adversity, more stresses, more anxiety, you want to focus on the pressure because it's easy. It's easy to give into it. Yeah. How did you learn to not focus on that pressure and, and, and continue to have success in doing so? I would say like, I'm, I'm still learning every day I'm learning, you know, and I think every day, like I get these obstacles and, you know, you choose how you handle them. So maybe when I was younger, I would have blown up about something that's really minute in, in all actuality. And now like everything is how you respond to it. And just like wrestling, you know, you could get taken down about to get tech ball and you can choose to give up and that's on yeah. you. Or you can choose to like rebuild and score one point at a time. And, you know, I think for me, and I'm actively working on this so much, but, you know, I just, I stay present because if you think about it, fear and anxiety that only lives in the future. So if you stay present, you know, you're not analyzing all those little stressors every single day. And sometimes, you know, like my coach, uh, Coach Lewis at WCAP, he just says, you know, like, be great today. You know, be great today. It's so simple. And can you imagine if like, <laughs> instead of worrying about, what am I going to do Thursday or Friday or Saturday? I have to do this and I have to do all this, all this stuff. And if I just focus on today and in this moment, in this practice, yeah. you know, it just like it lessens that load of, of stress that's continually, it's always going to be there. And has it um, always been that constant evolvement? Like even when, when you were younger, I mean, you started at six. So you've had, on one hand, you've had, you know, 20 years to continue to master that. But was it a certain point that you started really focusing on that? Or is it has it been something that since day one, you've continued to try to stay focused and stay present? Oh, I, w I wish I did this younger. <laughs> if I right. could go back in time. Yeah. No, because I totally didn't do it. But I don't know if maybe I, ha I didn't have the same stresses, you know, like now I'm 26, like I'm in the yeah. army, like there's, there's a lot more on my plate than yeah. when I just lived at the training center and everything was taken care of for me. Um, you know, at 18 years old. Right. So I in the last year, I've adamantly been working on that, you know, even two years, like seeing a sports psychologist and staying present. And, you know, for me, a big thing is just embracing that fear, you know, like the only way this can hurt me almost is if I, if I do, if I run from it. So like, you know, I was saying like last year at final X, just embracing that fear and those obstacles. Yeah, for sure. And I think you've done a good job. You know, you, you're very active on social. And I think the more active you are, the more of a glimpse you give people into that. And I think that's why some people kind of accrue more of a fan base than others. And I think part of that is when you are transparent about that. And, and that's one thing I've noticed. I'm also curious, you know, from, from a couple different stamp for a couple different things. One is that you have accomplished so many different things, right? You've, you've made multiple world teams, multiple junior world teams. Um, you've won final X, you've won the U S open. I'm just curious from everything you've done in wrestling so far, what do you think you're the most proud of? You know, honestly, I, I would simplify it and um, I'm happy that I'm still here, you know, like wrestling. Like I'm happy that years ago I didn't give into the sport, which, you know, like there was a slump in my career, in my life where I was like, you know, maybe this isn't worth it. Maybe I should just pursue my other passion and do that. And, and so I'm, I'm grateful that I still love the sport. And, you know, that's why I'm still here at 26, because I'm literally still having fun with it. I'm still learning. And so I think to be doing it all these years and still have that, like, because yeah, I can say I'm proud of like these random accolades that right. I don't ever look at, but they're there, you know, they're, they're cool for my, like, my friends come over and I can show them like my Joker shoe and my random plaques, but like, yeah that doesn't give me like life fulfillment, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so like, I'm proud that I've become a good like role model, you know, like just a better 
individual. Like I, so yeah, I, I took your question of like most proud wrestling accolade, but I'm just, I'm happy. I still love what I do. No, it's a good answer. And, and I've been asking more and more people that, and, and it's funny, not a single person I've asked yet has said something along the lines of like winning this or winning that, like not a specific championship. Right. And that's why, that's why I'm so curious by the question, because like when, when people ask me on the business side of things, like, what are you the most proud of this client or that client? And, and it, all, it all depends on what's going on in my life, but it varies from opportunities and, you know, things I get to do. And, just this past week, you know, Cal Sanderson became a client of mine very early on. And when he moved to Penn State, we became friends. And, you know, he's kind of made me feel like an honorary Penn State alumni. And <laughs> this past week, I, you know, it was there all day Monday. And we hung out for a couple hours in his office, just kind of talking about different things. And I'm like, man, this all stems from like my company giving me this opportunity. And when you ask me, like, you know, wh that what are you the most proudest in your business career? And something like, Man, like it's nothing what people think, and I think wrestling is very similar to that. Like for me, it's it's sitting on somebody's couch who everybody respects and everybody wants to hear more of, and I'm just sitting there like in a deep philosophical conversation. Like this is cool, you know. And I, I think wrestling and competition is the same. And you know, part of the reason I ask that now and not later in the episode is because like this is such an important year, 2020, and I, I think it's one of the reasons I I. I launch this podcast now because there's so many great Olympic stories of Olympic hopefuls. And I think it's so important to get these stories out. First of all, just being on the journey and being in the conversation of being an Olympic hopeful, I think is, is crazy. Like to, there's a difference between being qualified for an Olympic trial and actually being an Olympic hopeful or being like, you know, myself, I can be an Olympic hopeful all I want. I'm not going to Olympics for anything. I'm not even going to a trial for anything, you know? So 2020, in 2020, arguably, these next two months, I was just talking with somebody about this yesterday once I was finishing up the Victoria Anthony episode, was, you know, the, the men and women's comparisons are, are wild. Like, this year, I think both men's and women's have – five out of the six weights could be a returning world medalist. And it shows you how much depth and talent. I think 62 is the only women's weight. Mal, Mal has a medal. So there you go. So I, all I, was, six. So I was listening to this earlier and I was like, I think it's six for six actually. Yeah. See, I gotta see. I, I went through it in my head and I'm like, I thought it was all six, but so even more so. And, and I think that's one of the reasons yeah. like, you know, th this, it's nuts because everybody keeps talking about 65 kilos on the men's side, and we have crazy Zane, Yanni, all these guys, but no no medalists there. And the women's is so right. competitive that I think that's one of the reasons why there's there's wrestle offs for the Pan Am qualifiers this weekend. Like, yeah, I mean, and a big thing was in 16, like, uh, we just like we didn't get it done, you know, we didn't fare too well, and so it was like we're adamant because. You know, we'd rather qualify the way to Pan Ams than go into the last chance qualifier. I mean, right. that's no joke. So, um, so it, it is, you know, like I've had some people like, you know, ask me, like they seemed almost annoyed for me that I had this rust off. And I'm like, you know, I'm just trying to, yeah, I'm just trying to make the team, trying to qualify the weight. Like it's important, you know. Uh, I think we can all get caught up on little things, but again, it's, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to wrestle these girls before Olympic trials. I'll take that any day. Yeah. And, and what does it mean to you that there is such depth and there is such talent? And I think, you know, we kind of started talking about this before we started the podcast about, you know, I think winning creates relevance and the women's the women have done such a good job of, of winning and creating that excitement. Like it's not even just winning. I, I shouldn't say that. It's also the excitement. Like it, it's having an exciting style of wrestling and, and it's and now it's like okay, I'm pumped for these matches. Like, Helen and, and Ali wrestling is a great match. And then to think the winner gets you yeah. in a best of three. You know, like, it yeah. shows the depth and the talent. Like, what does it mean to, to be a part of that? And I think, you know, I was talking to Victoria about it. And that's why I love doing these episodes back to back because I think there's so much, like, little golden nuggets in there. You you guys are like the ones I think leading the charge, especially because of how how available social has made you guys that you can you can inspire. And I think to grow a sport, it starts at the youth level. And I think to get the youth involved, 
it really helps to look up to people. Like you said, you got interested because of a flyer. Victoria saw a demonstration in high school. I can't remember why Helen told me, but it was, it's all the same thing. None of it's like, you know, like the six year old who's looking up to you and who's watching the matches this weekend. And, and, and it's like, I want to be like her. Like, I think you guys are, are leading the charge right now. What does it mean to, to you to be a part of something that's so, I think in such a, uh, important phase of the growth. I think a lot of us recognized early on that we kind of had to do a little bit of the work on our own end. You know, if, if we wanted to have a certain coach, we had to seek them out to see if we could train with them. You know, if we wanted to get the word out there, like we just had to do it ourselves on social media and things like that. Um, and I remember having these conversations, gosh, um, like Sally Roberts, we were in Georgia four years ago, right before Olympic trials. And I remember we were just all just kind of like venting about like things that just aren't available for the women. And I remember sitting there with Sally and her being like fired up about it. It's like, she never like really thought about it almost. Yeah. And she's like, yeah, that's crazy. Like, I don't know if you met Sally, but she's kind of like sporadic and like energetic. <laughs> and we're like just sitting on a hotel bed talking about it. And she's like pumped about it. And then fast forward, Olympic trials happens. She doesn't make the team immediately gets to work for Russell, like a girl. And like the game has changed in four years. Yeah. So to think that that conversation started in a hotel room, just with WCAP females, just talking about things that just aren't available. And then to have somebody who was like, you know what? Wrestling isn't serving me anymore. I'm going to just, I'm going to take the role on myself. So like, I always tip my head out to Sally because I mean, she did the damn thing and in four years and it's still growing it. So Again, that goes back to my point of like, kind of, if you want the job done right, you got to do it yourself, you know. Yeah. And then that makes other people be like, oh wow, like I'm really here to watch my son. But that female, like I've had that so many times at Final X, where kids brought their son to watch. Like I'm trying to think who was at it in 18, like the male that was there, but like whoever it was, you know, but like they're here to see David Taylor this year, or you know Kyle Dake, or whoever it is. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, they became a fan of. Jenna Burkett because we happen to be wrestling the same day and that's huge. And now I, you know, like I've had like these little fans that saw me at an event that they weren't there to see me at. Um, yeah. So it, it's good. It's like about that whole staying relevant and doing the things on your own and then other people take interest. And, you know, sometimes that's just, that's just how the cookie crumbles, but it's, it's good to be a part of the movement that's changing the game, you know? And as long as my wrestling career lasts, I will always try to, you know, like, I'll always take a podcast interview. I will always take an interview over here. Like I will always sure, try to represent sure. the brand basically. Yep. And then when yep. I'm done wrestling, I'll, you know, always continue to try to give back. Whether I'm a wrestling coach or whatever life takes me. I'll always try to give back just so that I can see that growth, you know, still happening. And, you know, you are pretty active on social. Do you, do you take it upon yourself to try to continue growing the sport? Like you, you t talked about taking things in your own hands and being a part of that movement like is it something you're constantly thinking about like is that, i know you're active and I, and I know you're talking about it but do you does it happen naturally or are you trying to say like i want to inspire more young girls to wrestle or i want to bring more of a spotlight to this oh gosh it's just something that kind of happened naturally i think anyone all my friends would tell you like I've always been about social media, you know, like <laughs> I've worked with a bunch of different people and companies and promoting their stuff long before I was in the military and things like that. Um, so it's something that, like I just took an interest in was well, like, shoot, if I really like this product, like, why don't I talk to these people or, right. you know, things like that. So it, that kind of came natural. And then it helps that like my wife is the director of global marketing for, you know, that always APS. <laughs> so yeah, like I get a little bit of insight and, yeah. You know, we talk about that sort of things. And, you know, it's always, the, I'm always like, oh man, I'm, it sucks that like we don't have this or we don't have that. And it's like, well, I don't have to do something about it. And so it's like, right. oh, yeah. It was right. um, and then I just like, you know, over the years as I've grown up, like I try to be as authentic as possible on social media because, you know, I don't want kids to think like life's perfect and everything's great and like all these type of things, like all the cliche stuff. So I try to, you know, be as real as possible and I get, lots of different questions and you know i can't imagine if i was younger like some of the questions i would have wanted to ask um yeah. so i try to answer as many as possible when i do those like question things on instagram and it's like it's 
you always think it's like a simple answer. Sometimes I think like, oh, people probably already know that or whatever. Right. And then I get asked it a hundred times and I'm like, oh, wow, people, especially when I like made a dramatic weight loss, like I basically just got really fit in a few years kind of thing. Yeah. And people were like, what did you do? Like, why aren't you cutting weight anymore? Like what's happening? And then I was like, oh, I guess like I could probably get back and like let people know. Right. And, and it's something like being on the marketing side of it over the last decade, the more athletes, whether it's wrestlers or whoever that I work with, the more they're kind of amazed that people want the most simplistic details of your life answered. And it, yeah. it's it's not usually I feel like athletes try to bring whatever is super important to them and they try to shine a light yeah. on that because actually that, that's what's important to them. But a lot of times it, it's just the simple stuff. Like, what do you do when you wake up? Like, I remember... Um, <laughs> Anthony Kassar was in the podcast and he had said after NCAAs or in a in a press conference or an interview that basically like when he gets up every morning he takes a gratitude walk and that kind of resonated with me I'm like that's interesting I want to know more about that and we talked about it and I had all these people DM me like thank you for asking about that ever since NCAAs I was so curious like how did he start taking yeah. a gratitude walk what led to that all these things but if you were to ask Kassar, like, what's important to you, he's not going to talk about that because it's just it's his life. It's it's his regimen. And I Have think, <laughs> right. And I think there's there's so many things that high level athletes do that they overthink because to you, it's it's boring. You, you do it. You walk your dogs this way every day and you don't think about it. But somebody else is like, wait, you have dogs, you do this, you do that. Like, yeah, 100%. I think that's why people, we like, as fans, you know, people love just to see. So like the UFC embedded videos, like I personally watch I'm those. I'm obsessed just because... with those. I don't watch the fight and I watch those. <laughs> yeah. Cause you're like curious. I'm like, huh, I wonder what they do the week of. Like, I wonder right. how, like how emotional they act. So like, that's super important. Like you want to see how like the best in the game, like how they're acting. Like they seem like very calm about it. Are they like overly inspired? You know, and maybe that works for them. Um, so yeah, I totally, it is always, that will ask about like, you know, when I take my hikes or like what I do, like, you know, what I do when I'm not wrestling, like those, I get asked that more than I get like what wrestling technique I go right. over, you know? <laughs> Cause that's so like, that's one of the reasons I think aside from the actual people coming on this podcast and, and being, uh, sought after for, for more content like it's one of the reasons i think this podcast is as successful as it is because i'm not sitting here breaking down matches i don't right. care i don't care like what your approach is to beat the winner of helen and ally like I, it's just it's not of interest it's not of interest to me like i i'm i'm curious in your mindset i'm curious about your perspective i'm similar like with the ufc embedded like for me, it's not – look, at I was never a great wrestler, so I'm not going to talk about technique. And and there, there's so many people who are obsessed with technique. And great, there's there's a place yeah. for that, right? Like, um, who is it? Mike Mal on Flow? Like, he's got – he, you know, breaks down a move for 10 minutes. Like, And so yeah. many people love that. But I feel like there's so much – like, again, I don't watch the UFC fights or the majority of them, but I always watch UFC Embedded. Like, it's, yeah. it's fascinating to see, like, the, a day in the life of them. 100% and just like almost like how they act like especially when they balance kids like how they balance their relationship like I totally agree I like that more than I almost like the fight and I think that like should be reiterate because I think for younger athletes they're obsessed over winning I have to win everything I need to have 100 yeah. wins under my belt I need to have all the plaques and it's like just take a second to enjoy the journey because at the end of the day if you're remembered that you just won this tournament and this tournament I don't know, like that wouldn't make me sleep comfortably. If I'm known as being a person that took the time to do pictures and went out of my way to go give someone a tour of Fort Carson or the OTC yep. and that yeah. like I touch people and you know, that they're happy that I'm an advocate for like autism and LGBT, then like I can sleep peacefully at night knowing that my life isn't defined by wrestling, you know? And, and also like, you know, when you do that and, and you do stay more active, how do you not let it become a distraction? Like, I know a lot of people don't like social media. It's not that they don't like it, but, you know, th there's two different buckets, really, maybe three, but, like, those who use social media to try to grow a brand and those who maybe try to do it but don't do it either very well or don't give it too much effort. And and right. I know one of the athlete and more so, I think, on the coach side is they don't want people getting distracted. How do you stay active? And what have you found works for you to not get distracted by it? Um, I think I'm really picky with like who I follow maybe, or like who I have like 
you know, if it, if it brings me like negativity or stress, then I, I don't want to look at it. I mean, right. period, I'm you know, I, I, I could choose to look at, and don't get me wrong. I love that flow wrestling does the side by side that helps grow the sport. You know, sure. if you, if you put up a picture of Helen, Allie, me, it's going to get a to get people like oh shit they've all been on world teams together like i trained with helen at northern michigan like it's a story in itself yeah um, and it's all good things for the fan base and for the athlete keeps growing you know like cool like that's great i'm happy about it but i'm not gonna overly focus about it i'm not gonna like because it just gets you anxious and like i'm as i'm gonna you know growing like i'm not trying to feed my ego right like sure. that limits sure. me so much and so you can get caught up and either be like, Oh, that's really cool. Or like, man, I can't believe people are saying this about me. Like those people don't matter, you know? So I think I'm really picky in what I engage with and, you know, like you know, use social media for what it's worth. You know, like I love, I literally barely watched the Super Bowl. I mean, like I had it on, but yeah. it wasn't any of my <laughs> teams, but the tweets about it were freaking hilarious. So I'm going to scroll right. through that, right. you know? And I think it takes a lot of discipline too, because even for me, like I can't imagine for you being an athlete for me, you know, I do have so many relationships in the sport and I am pretty involved in the back end. So I know like sometimes why somebody didn't wrestle or what the real story is. And you see people, especially in the sport, run their mouth nonstop. And I want to just jump in. I'm like, like, I'm like, you idiot. No, it's this, 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 and that. Right. And you can't. Yeah. Like, and, and luckily for me, it's like, it's never worth jeopardizing the relationship. And it kind of keeps me not only humble, but keeps me that proper perspective. Like, okay, my relationship with this person and, and, and my trust with them and everything else is so much more important. But like, how do you, I'm sure there's been times you, you want to like, you know, verbally strangle someone for saying the dumbest of things. Like did, did that. And also like, I've, I've never personally, like, I don't know, I guess some people maybe talk crap about me. I don't know, but it, I'm not like, that well known to where people have so much of both sides of the opinion as you became more of a successful wrestler did you start noticing people talking more and then having to develop that discipline to not chime in yeah like my toughest lesson like when i think about it is in 2018 because i was so caught up reading everything you know because it was the first final x so it's like you get caught up in the hype yourself yeah. and so many people said so many different things and I got so like offended by it. Like, how can these people say this stuff about me? Like, you know, they just like, whatever. And it got in my head so much that I changed my wrestling for that final X, like was do almost like trying to prove a point and it yeah. made me wrestle way worse. So like it taught me the hardest lesson I needed to learn. And, and just like, you know what? I don't care what people say. Like I have to focus again, staying present and like what I'm going to do um, because yeah, that was a hard lesson. And especially in a year that like, you know, I was wrestling with like a fractured ankle, my ligaments were torn. And it's so, like all this stuff's happening. And I literally, if I wasn't on the wrestling mat, I was in a boot. And it's like, you can't tell anybody that like, you can't tell anyone like, this is the hardest year. Like I should have had surgery months ago. And now like that the surgery's passed me and I'm like, wow, like it's great to be healthy, you know, like kind of thing. Um, because yeah, like, you're just never like that's that falls into the whole like people pleasing like you want to kind of tell somebody off or tell your side and and justify yourself but like at the end of the day like that might not even work anyways so. right and it's tough because you know i think when you have a small audience they like, will we'll use this podcast as an example i purposely try to respond to every single person because i'm so grateful people listen to the show as that right. grows there becomes a point where you can't do that and you start to have to not only deal with the negativity, because it's easy when, you know, 10 people all message you saying, thank you so much for having so and so yeah. on. That's easy. But once it gets to 100, 200, 500 people messaging you, or the more successful and popular you are in one area, you're going to be more hated in another. So, yeah, yeah it's it's definitely and better. It, I guess it's good to learn that lesson in 18 verse 2020. Like, here we are now, I Pan Am <laughs> Trials. Pan Am qualifier wrestle offs just around the corner now here this weekend. And then you have the Pan Ams. If you make the team and then you have the Olympic trials. And then if you make that in the Olympics, like it's 2020, this is what you've been, you know, training so hard for. And what, what's your mindset, your perspective going into this, knowing what an opportunity is, but also, you know, going back to what you said earlier, which is not focusing on the pressure and staying present. Cause I think, you know, 
make the Olympic team or don't, win the Olympic medal or don't, but either way, you're going to remember this journey forever. And I think you, you, it sounds like you've really been self-aware and learning those things through it. Like, how are you staying present through these next, let's call it six months, um, to make sure that you don't put too much pressure on yourself? Yeah, totally. Because I think on one end, you could almost word it on yourself. Like you could almost stress yourself out. Like you could be like, this is the biggest year. This is the most important competition that I have to, I have to qualify the way like, and instead of like the, I have to, is like, I literally will, I will just sound dumb as hell. And I will literally just be like, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for this opportunity. I'm grateful for this wrestle off. You know, like I'm not focused on Saturday because today's Monday. I'm focused on Monday, you know, like I got my workout in and, you know, I'm diligent and like, I can't think ahead. Like as soon as the clock struck midnight and it was January, you know, 1, 2020, just 2020, like that can be intense. Overwhelming, yeah. (gasps) Yeah. And you're like, you kind of, you know, you just got to like take a seat and enjoy the journey. It's so cliche, but, you know, I can't think about April 4th. I can't think about. Ottawa, Canada for the qualification, you know, it's, and I'm not even thinking about Helen or Allie today. Like it's, it's literally Monday. So yeah. uh, again, I just try to stay as present as possible. And, you know, again, and say that I'm grateful. Of course I'm going to have anxiety, you know, like Saturday will be here before I know it. Like whether I like it or not, Saturday's coming, sure. you know, yeah. Olympic trials is coming. So like, why not take it all in and enjoy it? You know, like just have fun. Uh, because I, I was I was simplifying the other day. I was like on the treadmill and I was like, oh, my God, next week I leave. Like, I got to do this. Like thinking about logistics, I got to do like I got to take my car to the shop. And I was like, you know, like, Adulting. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, it's 12 minutes of wrestling. Benna. Like we do that way more every day. Like I kind of laugh at myself. I'm like, it's 12 minutes, sweetie. Like we can do anything for 12 minutes. You know, right. <laughs> and I'm curious, you know, one, one of the last things here, I'll kind of pick your brain on, you know, I think. Even for me, the one thing I'm nervous about with with the Olympic trials is that pe- people come on this podcast, and I'd say a good majority of them, I become an even bigger fan of. Because you spend an hour with someone, and you're like, okay, I'm rooting for you, right? And right. it's like, okay, I'm going to be rooting for you now. Helen's a client of mine. She was on, like, I'm rooting for her. It's like, and, and yeah. only one of you can fulfill that dream, and, and you're, you know, like... I always bring up Zane and Yanni because Zane's a client of mine. He's with us at Scrap Life. He's a friend of mine. Yeah. Yanni grew up five minutes from me. Like he's a friend of mine, and it's hard for me to celebrate with the one because I'm kind of with the other. Like I, 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 yeah. I feel that right. And uh, I think one of the things I'm curious of is how you know I feel like fans are very easily discouraged too. Like we sometimes forget how what the athlete's going through because the fan is so invested. Right. Yeah. What and, and I think once I hear people like kind of put things in perspective where it's like, look at I lost or I won. That doesn't define me. Life goes on. Like you said, I'm a soldier first, a wrestler second. And you kind of keep things in perspective. And I think sometimes it's easier for the athlete and the fan, but sometimes it's not. And I'm curious what, when you've had disappointing finishes, what's been your kind of recipe for moving on and not getting discouraged and just throwing the towel in? Like, I'm sure there's been so many times before where it's like, why am I even doing this? You know, like, I don't know. I'm, I'm so competitive, so I hate to lose. And I'm curious yeah, about that perspective. And you get like, you get caught up in it. Like even like, you know, I just competed in Italy and there was like 25 girls in the weight class. I end up fifth. And I could have chose to like look at fifth place finish. Like we just missed the podium. Yeah. But the whole point of going to Italy, you know, I was on three weeks, three and a half weeks of training after BLC. So I knew going in, like, hey, this isn't the best Jenna, but I know I'm gonna continue to get better. Like yep. all I wanted to do was go there and get matches. And what do I do? I get five matches and everybody's a freaking medalist almost. <laughs> right. Fun. Like I'm wrestling the reigning world champ from Canada for a bronze medal like it's wild how you know how lucky am i that that's how good women's wrestling is and like i could choose to get caught up like well if i would have had this person you know i would have i would have done this but again i was just i sat back in italy and just was grateful that you know i got five stellar matches come from behind matches and that was something like i needed for myself so you know i had to reset like of course i'm pissed i'm not on the podium like i'm a competitive person and you know you could say that 
with all the, you know, like in 18, I was disappointed that I lost to Allie and, and the way I kind of wrestled. Um, but I don't know, like, it's, it's hard to even think of like, you know, what I did because of course I was sad, but for me, it was like, my next focus was competing in a tournament overseas. And then it was going to BLC. I originally was supposed to go a whole year earlier. So I think for me, it helps that I don't put all my like eggs in one basket. I find that people who have these losses, they struggle because wrestling is everything. You know, they wake up and it's like, if they're not winning, like, they're devastated. And it was like, Tony Ramos tweeted this. I, I don't remember the exact quote or, or tweet of it, but it was like, you could do everything in wrestling. You could do everything right. You could do all this stuff and you still might not win. And if, and he yeah. was like, and if you can yeah. live with that, then like, you know, you know, keep coming back or, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. And that spoke volume to me because I was like, wow, like that's happened so many times. You're like, hey, I don't do the wrong things off the mat. Like I've been tested freaking nine times from USADA since January <laughs> the 8th. Like oh I literally gosh. am one of the most tested wrestlers right now. I had to ask because I was so annoyed, you know, <laughs> and I was like, I'm doing the right things. Like I get tested in the military. I get tested from USADA. Like, I'm like, yo, I promise doing the right thing, <laughs> right. you know, and like I'm doing the, you know, the right things on and off the mat. And you could get so caught up in the hype of why me and like that victimizing mentality. But I mean, that's the whole beauty of why people obsessively watch the sport because you can watch two athletes who do the right things and you like them and you're rooting for them, you know, and only one gets their hand raised. And so I think if we can learn to to live with that and, and again, not put all our eggs in one basket and knowing that like, hey, I'm good at this, this and this and wrestling doesn't define me and all those type of things. At the end of the day, you're going to be sad, but, you you know, the sun still comes up. Yep. Final thing I'll ask you, and then I'll let you go because you're probably going to get tested for the 10th time. <laughs> right, right. I, see, I put it in the air, and they're going to knock on my door. <laughs> right. What, what do you think, out of everything going on this year, what do you think you're the most excited for? Ooh, um, gosh, I mean, like, Olympic trials is something spectacular. It's like, even if you're, at, you know, just there as a fan, like, you're excited for that. Um, cause you, like you, I love seeing how passionate people are and I'm excited to see it like, you know, in Penn state, like that's really cool. You know, I tend to do well if it's on the East coast. So I'm feeling really good about that. Like it's, you know, I've wrestled in Pennsylvania like a million times in my life and just that area in general. So, uh, like it's good vibes for me, but yeah, I would say Olympic trials. It's just like something you like you, all those nerves and all those like opportunities, like, it's unlike anything else. And then like you go from that and all those fans and all that, and then you're hopefully on the Olympic team. So it's hard. This year is like an insane year. Cause it's almost hard to pinpoint. Like, of course you're going to be excited for the Olympics in Tokyo. Women's wrestling is the number one sport there. Right. Like, <laughs> women's wrestling in Japan. Like you're a rock star. Like they love women's wrestling. Yeah. So <laughs> to get a taste of that and like, have my, you know, like hopefully, you know, like have my family there and do all that type of stuff. Like, it'll be electric. So there's almost so many, there's too many things to look forward to. And you know, the fact that I can say that means like life's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. And, and I'm like, selfishly, I'm so excited for the trials, but as I, as I said, like, I'm, I'm also kind of nervous because I'm somebody who I've learned to empathize with people. And for me, it's almost easier to mourn with someone than to rejoice with someone. Cause I just, I've right. been through so much. Like it's just, it's more natural for me. So like, I'm, I'm so excited, but I know how much is on the line and you talk to someone, it's like, man, there's so much on the line. And in, in as a fan, like I haven't been to an Olympic trials yet. So this is my, not only my yeah. first Olympic trials I'm going to, like it's at Penn state where I feel like an honorary alumni. So it feels like home to me. Like it couldn't be better scenario, but then I, I instantly think like, it, um, I'm sure by then, like, it's just at all, almost every way there's gonna be at least two people that if they wrestle in the finals, I'm gonna be like, Oh man, am I going to be like more excited for the winner or am I going to be more upset for the loser? But it's definitely something that just to be a part of, and you know, on my end, just to have those relationships and have those connections where I can be so, you know, emotionally and physically invested into the matches. It's right. It's and I think wild. as an athlete, like we appreciate, you know, like we appreciate people like you, you know, genuinely because, that's the only way the sport grows. And so it's awesome to see people that are like, you know what, this isn't being talked about. Like I want to start my own podcast, you know, like yeah. 
Like that's insanely cool. And it's it's cool too because it, it's so contagious. Like, but before we started dating and engaged and married, like my wife had never heard of a single like wrestling match in her life, and now like she does. There's like a different side to me that when you're watching a wrestling match, you can't sit down. You have to like pace around the living room. Like it, it's something so different. She's just not used to because I only act that way when I'm watching wrestling. And it's just right. such a different level of like invested into the match. It's just like, what's happening with you? <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's totally unlike other sports because otherwise you're watching multiple players. Like at this point you're invested in like, you know, there's two athletes, but maybe you're overly invested in one athlete. Like, that in itself is going to make you like, like your general yeah. stuff. Like I, I like, I'll literally watch, like I was watching Penn state and Iowa and like my heart rate was like insane. And I'm like, I'm, I have no affiliation to these people. <laughs> yeah. My heart was in my stomach for that duel. It's, yeah. uh, well, listen, I'm so grateful you took an hour of your time to join the show. I think your fans and the fans in general, of this podcast are going to be appreciative of it. And it should definitely be out before you wrestle off this weekend. So give people a little bit more of an opportunity to know you even more and then root for you even more. (laughs) So (laughs) thanks for stopping by and good luck this weekend. Thanks, Justin. Have a good one. See ya. And that is today's show. Thank you for tuning in and for listening. Let me know what you thought of today's conversation. Send me a message, tag the show, send me an email, leave a comment, whatever you want to do. But I'm trying to be consistent with the guests that come on while maintaining a good variety for the show. So let me know what you think. And If you're new around here, there's so much more to listen to. Be sure to go back through the archives, listen to the other, as of now, other 33 episodes and and conversations that have been published. So be sure to subscribe, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen, and be notified when new episodes dropped. And if you are interested in apparel or merchandise, go to shop.bashmania.com. And aside from all that, I will see you next time. See ya! And the beat goes on, goes on, goes on, goes on, goes on.